The big question, will the jury be able to come to a decision this time around? I have two great guests in the studio here with me to discuss it. Criminal defense attorney and former prosecutor Keith Lamar and criminal defense attorney Marsha Migno. Great to have you both here. Thank you for lending your expertise Thank to Court TV me. Live. Uh, Marsha, I want to toss the first question at you. I got to talk with Keith earlier as we were waiting for the motion, hearings to start up and whatnot. What would you do differently? Let's say you were on the defense side of this case, knowing there's no burden, defense doesn't have to put on a shred of evidence, but does get a second bite at the apple, the benefit of all those trial transcripts. What might you do differently if you were representing Kellen Wenzel II? Well, the most I uh, would focus on the testimony that was provided previously to the witnesses, by the witnesses, mm -hmm. and make sure that I picked out every single inconsistency, asking them the question again. One of the second things that I would do is this time my defendant needs to testify. There's a lot on the line, and because so much is on the line, I need you to explain your story as to what you said happened. Um, trying cases now are becoming more difficult. People are getting a lot of television. We're inundated with information coming from every single source. And a lot of times, although you have the constitutional right to remain silent, you're gonna have to speak. Right. You make a great point. That's exactly what Keith and I were saying. And you were en route here to our studios and didn't hear the conversation. But I'm so glad that you agree because it's something that we were talking about. I can't see any downside at this point because at this point, we've already got the, the convictions. They're coming in. This jury's going to learn about that. California has a law that allows for that in a case where sexually assaultive behavior is being alleged. And then the state can use those bad acts, so to speak, prior convictions, whatever you want to call it, it can be considered. And so it really flies against what we, we know generally that the rules of evidence do protect from, from something like that. But in California, no, this is coming in. So if they're going to hear about it anyways, what risk does he run? I mean, really, I, I'm just, I, I hope I see that this time. I mean, I think, I know it's his right not to, you know, certainly that is his right. But... I feel like if there's a chance of them prevailing, I think the defense has a great chance. I really do. I think it's anybody's case. I think that may tip the scales in their favor. Keith, what do you yeah, say? Yeah, I agree, and I'm glad you said that. We said that yeah. earlier about uh, taking the stand. You're not saying that no sex occurred at all. Right. So that's a different thing. If you're saying, I don't even know these women, you know, I wasn't there, that's a totally different situation. But you're saying that you did it, okay? So you gotta go in there, you gotta talk about it. You gotta bring it up. You've right. gotta give them a motive as to why these women would not be telling the truth. Mm -hmm. These are some egregious allegations. Mm -hmm. And when allegations are this serious, you have to find a motive behind. Why someone who's a complete stranger of you is going to make up something this outlandish? You have to explain it. It is tough, it is scary, because you don't know how your witness is going to handle cross-examination, and you know they're gonna to get to grill your defendant on the stand. And I always call that jury box the hot seat, mm -hmm. because you sit in that seat, and no matter how you prepare, you prep, you think your witnesses are ready, and something just triggers in that courtroom, and all of a sudden, they're caving. Right. Your case is falling apart, and you're like, oh my God, we would have done better had I just kept this person off the stand. <laughs> right, Marcia. And we have just just a, a moment before we're going to need to take a break, but I want to ask you briefly about one of the motions we heard, and that was uh, prior to the jury being brought in regarding whether the prosecution can refer to these accusers as victims. The defense was saying, no, we don't want that to happen. We think that's prejudicial to our client. And the judge said, state, you can call them victims. Defense, you can call them complaining witnesses, alleged victims, call them, you know, Jane Doe, however you want to identify them, but that's up to you. What do you think? Right decision, Keith? Oh, yeah, definitely the right decision. Um, you know, they're victims, okay? That's how, they, that's how they're gonna say it. It's the state's having to prove a case saying these are victims. You can't say victim, I mean, that's kind of ridiculous for the state to go through and say the person's name or Jane Doe the entire time as a state. Uh, any case that a state has, whether it be a rape case or a robbery case or even a burglary or a simple entering an auto case, it's a victim involved. So I think that's pretty fair for the judge to allow them to say yes. victim. Yes. Marcia, do you agree? I disagree with that. And the only reason why I disagree is because if a defendant is innocent until proven guilty, I would force them to call them alleged victims. I wouldn't take the victim off, but I would put the alleged title on there mm -hmm. because you are the ultimate trier of fact. Mm -hmm. Members of the jury, you're going to determine once the evidence is closed whether they're actually victims or not. And I think that the judge saying. did throw that out there. He said, well, defense, you can call them alleged victim, mm -hmm. but I'm allowed to state the 
do what the state does. Uh, but I do like that. And I think that the defense sure. should make sure that they say alleged, alleged over right. and over again. Yes. Because if it's consensual, it's definitely alleged. Yes, you both make great points there. Appreciate it. We're not letting you go anywhere. You're going to stay with us. We want you to stay with us at home. Opening statements should begin at any moment. We're going to take you in there live immediately. Let's squeeze in a quick break. California versus Kellen Winslow the second begins in minutes. Welcome back to Court TV Live, your front row seat to justice. I'm Julie Grant. Thank you so much for being with us on this Monday as we are set to begin the next big trial we're covering for you here on Court TV Live. That is the retrial of former NFL star and convicted rapist Kellen Winslow II. Right now, the jury is out of the courtroom. They're taking a break before the opening statements begin. That's going to happen at any moment. We promise we've got our cameras ready to go as soon as the judge takes the bench and the jury's brought in. We're going to bring you in there live. In the meantime, when continue talking with my special guests I have in the studio, attorneys Keith Lamar and Marsha Migno. Thank you both for staying with me. And let's go back, if we can, to one of the motions that was argued before the court. We talked a little bit before the break about the motion to refer to these Jane Doe accusers as victims. And the judge essentially said, look, I'm going to let you lawyers be advocates. Advocate in what way you will, whether you're on the state side and saying victims or on the defense side calling them complaining witnesses, however you want to do it, going to be up to you. But you also heard arguments from the defense. They wanted to get in some statements made by Jane Doe number two, who's going to be the first witness the state calls. And these were statements made to the sexual assault nurse examiner when she had uh, the examination done after reporting the alleged instance. Now, again, this is Jane Doe number two, who there's already a rape conviction with respect to her allegations against Kellen Wins as a second. The allegation that has her here today is one of forcible sodomy. And the defense wanted to put in some statements she made um, regarding uh, Bobby Guzman, who is her boyfriend or was her boyfriend at the time, his DNA being found on her uh, genitalia. And Kellen Wenzel II's DNA was not. And apparently there was some redness around her vaginal area, and the defense wanted to be able to cross-examine her about that consensual sex with him, the DNA, the redness, and whatnot. And the judge ultimately said the redness in the vaginal area isn't relevant uh, because that charge has already been disposed of. We know there's been a conviction there. Um, the only charge that's relevant is the forcible sodomy charge, and he said where you're going here just doesn't have any probative value, so that's going to be excluded, those statements in that line of questioning. Uh, did you agree with that decision? What did you uh, think of that, uh, well, Keith? Well, you know, I, I didn't agree with it. I think it should have came in. I think the reason it should have came in is because we're saying that he did this to sodomy. So if he's, if he's having sex with somebody, not Kellen Winslow, that could have happened. You know, it might not have been forcible, but you never know what could happen. So why not bring it in? It's a, it's a good part for the defense to even bring it up as a question. And I think at least try it. I don't see where it could have hurt. I didn't see the prejudice with it. I didn't see where they can, you know, why hold it out? Sure, sure. Marsha, what did you think? I understand why the court wanted to exclude it, because the court is saying that's a vaginal issue, this is a rectal issue, and forced sodomy would be something associated with the rectum. But I do concur as it pertains to intercourse, because the organs are so so closely related. When two individuals are having contact, it could have easily been caused by any intercourse. And the time frame in between the intercourse between the boyfriend and the, uh, the defendant was so close in proximity. You're talking right. about a three, three day, days, four day yes. period. Mm -hmm. And for DNA to still be present for him and no DNA be present for the defendant, I find that it's relevant when you look at the totality of the circumstances. Mm -hmm. If you're just looking at them independently, yes, you might say, I'm going to exclude it. But if I were the judge and I'm looking Looking at the totality of the circumstances, I'm like, no, I'm going to let it in because I want them. Now, I might limit it mm -hmm. and, and I might, you know, uh, grant the state's objection during uh, cross-examination, depending on where I see the defense going with it. So I would control the reins, but I would give them a little bit of deference to go into because of the close proximity um, between the mm -hmm. sex. Sure. Yeah. Keith, anything you want to add? Yeah, I, yeah. I agree with that. You know, mm -hmm. I think you allow it in, but limit it. You know, that makes a lot of sense. You know, boom, come in. Oh, you're going a little bit too far. We're going to reel you back in. Mm -hmm. And now you need to calm it down, stay here along this path. So that makes perfect sense. And that's what the judge, I think, should have done. This allowed to come in a little bit, and then you calm, you calm it down if it goes too far. Sure. Well, you know, it was good on these attorneys that they, they raised that issue prior to trial. It's on the record. It's part of the record. And we'll see where it happens. I mean, last time we know the jury was deadlocked on that mm -hmm. count. So, oh, yeah. um, 
it'll be, I, I'm, I think this is anybody's game, this oh, yeah. retrial. And I want to know your thoughts. I, I know that typically retrials will favor the state or the Commonwealth because you know what evidence you have when you're on the side of the state. You don't know what the defense might do. Right. You get to see what defense is presented and, and revise your case accordingly if you need right. to. What do you think in this case, though, Keith? You know, when you, when you look at this case, uh, when I ever I had retrials, I was kind of eager to get to the retrial. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay, okay. We, I know what they're trying to get me right. with now. Right. But I think that this time around, the state, sorry, the defense has a better chance this time around than they did the first time around looking at the way the facts are set up. Mm -hmm. uh, I know that they've changed the order already for number two to go first, but I think this, the defense has a good chance if they can control the way number two uh, goes about talking to the jury, because right now that's their best witness. Number one is a little bit lackluster, and then the number, I think it's Jane Doe 4, um, sees, you know, the timing of hers is totally different from everybody else on the stand. Mm -hmm. right? Hers is 2003, everybody else is more 18, 17. Mm -hmm. Right. What do you think, Hershey? My, my strategy this time would be use more female contact with these female victims. Mm -hmm. Um, if you have a woman cross-examining a female that says she was, you know, assaulted by a male, sometimes jurors are more acceptable of some of the conduct or some of the grilling or some of the, you know, the, the eagerness of the cross-examination sure. that can take place. Women can sometimes get away with things on cross-examination with other female women victims that male counterparts cannot. Right. So That's I would point. introduce more women into my cross-examination mm -hmm. of these alleged victims right. because she can ask questions that I can't and as a male. The only issue is that, you know, this guy does it by himself. Uh, the, 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 state, right. yeah, the state does it by himself. It's yes. still mind-blowing to me. Yes. But, you know, I think he should have somebody from the office. I'm sure they have some um, female ADAs in the office. Why not have them sit at the table with you and help you? Mm -hmm. You could, right. I, I love that about him. And that was something that I, I admired last time. I'm yeah. going to say it again. Hats off to him. And I, I think it's advantageous from a couple um, standpoints. Number one, the jury gets to hear from the same voice, mm -hmm. the same voice carrying them throughout the trial, the opening statements at the outset, the questioning of all the witnesses, the cross-examinations, and then wrapping it all up in close. Sometimes I feel like, especially if, if attorneys aren't on the same page with their legal theme, their theory, mm -hmm. things can get lost. Maybe there's, um, it seems a little disjointed, maybe from open to close when you have different voices. So I like that he builds a rapport with them. There's consistency, all that. And then by the same token, the other thing that I think is really helpful, too, is you see the prosecutor sitting there all alone <laughs> at the table, outnumbered, and on the defense yeah. side, the defendant's surrounded by three, you know, very capable, right. you know, competent trial attorneys, and, you know, who knows how many, if there's a, I, I don't know in particular in this case, sometimes we see jury consultants sitting back rowing them, so to speak. I, I know that our field producer, Emanuela Grinberg, let us know that Brian Watkins, who was one of the lead attorneys last time, is sitting in the courtroom um, so I believe somewhat uh, involved, at least from a supportive standpoint, uh, even though he's not going to be trying the case, okay. sort of taking a supportive role there. And Kellen Winslow II's mother and father are also there in the courtroom. But there's a rule that permits us, uh, prohibits us, excuse me, from showing the gallery in the courtroom, so we can't show them to all of you at home. So that is why. Um, what do you think about that? The prosecutor trying it by himself, and do you think that says something to a jury, Marsha, that it, he's all alone and the other side's outnumbering him? On the positive side, for him. It looks like, look at this wealthy celebrity. Look how much help he can afford mm -hmm. to, you know, fight a case. And look at my poor victims, and they don't have the resources. And us little old state, mm -hmm. we're just sitting here all by our lonesome, just right. trying to get justice for these women. Right. So on, on that end, he looks good, because it looks like my money can buy me a lot of people on my side of the courtroom. On the opposite side, if there's anything that you're overwhelmed with or because you're constantly going back and forth, you know your case pretty good, you don't have that second person who you can say, hey, did I ask that extra question? What did I miss of the bullets that I were going down? Or something that even on cross-examination or direct examination that you knew you wanted to get out but you didn't because you didn't go that further with the question. That sounding board next to you at the table is good. And you can still do that while keeping your voice. The person never gets up, they never open, they never close. Yes. You do it all so you make a connection, right. but you always have that second set of eyes that can say, hey, juror number seven, roll their eyes at you when you said that, yes. don't do it again. Yes. So you can get body language feedback Great from point. your jurors and you can fix what needs to be fixed Great while it's point, going on. Marcia. They can look at the transcripts because you have the benefit of the trial transcripts if you need them for, let's say, impeachment purposes. Mm -hmm. 
it's pretty hard as an advocate to recall off the top of your head everything somebody said. I mean, you can know a transcript well, but to make sure, and that's kind of the, the point of having an assistant there to, you know, I mean, co-chair yeah, the case and then pop open the binder when it's time to, to impeach the witness and help out. Here's the paper you need. And go if ahead you, and go. If you know, if you see, you see, you'll see sometimes in court where somebody might walk up and tap the person on the shoulder and give them a little white, you know, right, sticky right. note like, hey, you didn't say this. So, you know, when you get up on stand, it's, it's a lot going through your head as an attorney. You're like, okay, I want to make sure I hit this point and you want to hit it at the right timing. I mean, it's everything. You know, you want to make sure there's an impact. So I don't want to ask the question too early or too late. And sometimes you might even sit down and say, oh, I want to do this. That other person at the table could be, hey, don't sit down yet. Remember, we got two more things you want to talk to. Right. And I like that you brought up that other person looking at the jury. So therefore, when you get up next time to speak, oh, this jury member wasn't listening to that. Now let me go back and hit this point. I want to redirect this person really quickly because I saw where well, that jury didn't understand what I was talking about. Right. So he doesn't really have that right now, at least to our knowledge that we can see. So I would love for him to get a second person, even if they don't speak. Mm -hmm. Just somebody up there to be a nice person to say, hey, okay, I'm going to sit here with you. I'm going to pass you some notes. Maybe get you some water here and there. Right, I know you right. might get a little dry mouth. <laughs> and let's get it going. Yes, yeah, cute. <laughs> Second chair, even in a very passive role, right. just to get the water, the coffee, whatever Sorry. you need, just yeah. to be there to help out. No, I agree, absolutely. Yeah. And obviously, it's a strategic decision. I mean, he's a deputy DA, mm -hmm. so he's going to be a supervising Correct. assistant district attorney, so to speak. It's the designation of deputy, so being mm -hmm. higher ranked in that office office and somebody who, from what I understand, I mean, has taught to lots of lawyers mm -hmm. who've worked underneath him and seen him as a mentor and he's taught them how to try cases and he's got a lot of experience in this unit. Yeah. I, must just be his style, like, no thanks. I would take an intern. Go it alone. You know? <laughs> would take an intern? I would yeah. take an intern. Right. No, I, I would too if I was available to me. I mean, you know. Um, he might I, see it as a distraction. It's yeah. like, you know, yeah. having somebody at table is a distraction because they're talking in your ear. You're trying to listen to the witness. You're trying yeah. to figure out where you're going with yeah. it. So he might work red or alone, but yes. you, you never know. <laughs> right. Well, we're going to see some some great lawyering in a matter of minutes. Uh, Marsha and Keith, thank you for your great expertise. We're going to squeeze in a quick break. We're still waiting for those attorneys to come out of chambers. They're talking with the judge still, and what we're hearing is that about five minutes after two, they're going to bring the jury back into the courtroom. That is what we're getting from our sources in the courtroom. Live coverage of California versus Cuddle and Winslow. The second begins in minutes. Don't go away. TV. So, uh, if you're just now joining our coverage, you haven't missed anything yet, we are waiting for the opening statements to begin in the case in San Diego, California, against former NFL star and convicted rapist Kellen Wenslow II. This is a live look at the seal inside the courtroom. The attorneys are in chambers with the judge. We've got a pretty full courtroom, a lot of media on one side of the courtroom, taking up a great deal of space. And on the other side, we have Kellen Wenslow's mother and father, we also uh, have Brian Watkins. If you remember that name, he was one of the lead defense attorneys on the case, not trying the case, but still supporting Kellen Wenslow, supporting his uh, attorney colleagues in this retrial. And we're not permitted to show the gallery. We're just not allowed to. That's part of California law. So we're just going to tell you what's happening in the gallery. So as soon as things get picked back up in the courtroom, we're going to take you in there live. In the meantime, I want to turn to my guests here in the studio, criminal defense attorneys, Marsha McNo and Keith Lamar. Thank you both so much for staying with us. Uh, tell me, as we're getting ready for the opening statements, if you were on either side, what would your, your theme and your legal theory be? Essentially, how would you try the case? What would you really go for this second time around? And we saw what they did the first time. What would you maybe do differently this time with a second bite at the apple? Keith. Well, you know, this time from the state side? Yeah, so let's start with the state side. Um, from the state perspective, I guess the theme would be, you know, this is a predator. You know, this is a predator that likes to target these type of ladies. You know, you have a homeless woman here. You have everybody besides that one, uh, Jane, Jane Doe number four. Everybody's over here in their 50s. One lady, 77. Um, it's the same uh, theme as far as pulling up on strangers, putting them in the car, and then taking advantage of them. So I would say he's a predator, and I would go with that all the way through. I will talk about that he knows what he's doing. He knew that these women were at a low point in their lives. He's a millionaire picking up a homeless woman on the side of the road. It doesn't look good. Sure. If I'm the prosecutor, I would use that word. You said predator. Predator, praying. I would say it. Weave it all through mm -hmm. the opening statement. Great thoughts, Keith. Marsha, if you were on the state side, what would you do for theme and, and, and theory you'd put for you? If I am on the state side, I would say, you know, millionaires think they can do whatever they want to do. I'm a star. 
I can do whatever I want to do. So his status in society is why he believes he has an entitlement mentality. I'm entitled to take what I want whenever I want. And he thinks that these type of victims are victims that are not going to be believable. So because he doesn't believe they're believable, he targets them. And based on that, that's why we're here. We're asking you to stand up for them, and I would just go in. Right. Now, for defense, all bets are off. Mm -hmm. I've already got a client that's convicted, mm -hmm. so I'm going in with hell hath no fury like mm -hmm. a woman scorned. Mm -hmm. And I'm going in, and I'm like, right. they, they, they're they dating, you're a celebrity, they think there's going to be a relationship, everybody's going to get married, they're going to have the 2.5 kids and a white picket fence, and when it doesn't happen, this is where we come. We come to seek justice. Mm -hmm. It's revenge. Mm -hmm. And it's revenge because I didn't get what I wanted out of the relationship, and now I'm going to use the state as a catalyst to getting back at you. So, and that's the downside of being a star. You know? Keith, give me your quick thoughts. Dury is walking in, so give me All your right. quick thoughts. Quick as a defense, downside of being a star, um, when you're a celebrity, anything you do that's not right will be magnified. And look at this today. Yeah, right. I mean, all lies are, are on him. And I think that's what's made this case so fascinating to so many people is that you look at, at him from the outside and you think this guy has this fantastic life. I mean, what more could you want? This illustrious career, lots of money, grew up with a loving family it, with, I mean, really not having to want for anything. I mean, which his dad's a superstar and two beautiful children, a wife. I mean, we know she recently filed for divorce, uh, presumably because of all of this, this yes, mess. Um, but I think that's that's really key here is the celebrity aspect. So we'll see, maybe the state will, will bring that in and maybe the defense will use that to their advantage too. That's one of those those sets of facts that both sides can can take and, and really use it to their advantage. And the jury is walking in. I'm being told the judge is still not on the, oh, there he is. Okay, he is taking the bench. Let's go in together now live. 11 o'clock, well, 1045 when you came back. There, uh, there are some issues that have come up that we need to handle outside your presence. And I don't want you waiting around for us to do that. So what I'm going to do is, and I apologize for this, but sometimes things happen during the course of a trial that uh, cause delays which are unanticipated, and this is one of those situations. So I'm going to let you go for now. You're going to come back at 1.30. I apologize for the delay, but I'd, I'd rather have you out and about rather than sitting on those benches out in the hallway. So I'm going to order you all back at 1.30. I apologize. These are, uh, as I said, sometimes things come up that are beyond the control of the court. Please do not speculate about these proceedings. They involve legal issues only, which the court and counsel must work through before we proceed with the trial. So we'll see you back here right at 1.30. Don't discuss the case with anybody or form or express any opinions. And I will have counsel come back at 1 o'clock, all right, so we can finish up these things. So I'll see counsel and everybody back at 1 o'clock, but the jurors, 1.30. Okay, so have a nice long lunch. We'll see you back here right at 1.30. Okay, so don't you want to know what that is all about? I do too. We do. We're working to find out. We've got our Court TV crew there. We're trying to get in touch with them and see if they can find out why this trial is being delayed. Delayed. Excuse me there. Okay, so what we're going to do, I'm going to bring in our two guests in the studio, and we're going to continue talking. As soon as we get some information, it's for the delay. So you heard the judge. He's saying 1.30 p.m., uh, they're on the West Coast. This trial is taking place in San Diego, so that would be 4.30 p.m. Eastern time. The jury would be brought back. Okay, I want to turn back to Keith and Marcia now. Hmm, this is puzzling. Uh, wonder what is going on. I, I'm not thinking a plea agreement. I'm really not. Are you thinking that? I, I would be shocked, honestly, after, right. after all this. You know, this is the second time around, right? This is not the first time we're going to trial and get cold mm -hmm. feet, so you know what, I'm going to take a plea. Right. But you never know. You know, trials, that's one of those things as an attorney, especially when I used to be a prosecutor, you prepare all weekend, you're up all night, you're going back and forth with your people at home, and then they come in and they take a plea. Right, You know, right. but I don't think that's happening. They're probably trying to hold a couple more things out. That's what I'm guessing. I, I'm not thinking plea agreement. What do you think, Marcia? It, it could be a witness issue. Mm -hmm. You know okay. what I mean? So uh -huh. Jane Doe number two, when she testified originally, had some issues facing the defendant. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if the state, I'm just guessing that the state may have some issues with Jane Doe number two saying, this is a second time. I mustered up every strength that I had the first time to face this guy. Mm -hmm. I cannot do this again. If that happens as a prosecutor, what I'm doing is I'm going, okay, let me make another 
another offer mm -hmm. that would be a lot closer uh, and hope that the knees of the defendant buckles. And he says, I'll take it because he doesn't want to spend the rest of his life in prison. Sure. So I'm guessing it could be a witness issue. And because it's a witness issue and the state has to go first, mm -hmm. that they need the time to get a psychologist or a psychiatrist or a counselor or a therapist or something to talk witness number mm -hmm. one mm -hmm. into getting in that box. Right, right. You know, it's it's hard to get because you both know anything can happen yeah. at trial, and and it's really and I I think it's important to understand that for our viewers to understand too when sometimes you want things to go a certain way and you right. do everything right it as really an attorney and right and it's like every a lot is out of your control yeah. it's like herding cats right. sometimes you've got to make sure that everybody you've subpoenaed is showing up and then everybody has lives it's not like the case is everyone's right. life i mean real life emergencies happen things come up people change their mind witnesses we know go south or decide that i mean those are the hardest things about right. trial you know when you're preparing for a trial you look for your invest your investigator is your best friend mm -hmm. Uh, stay in the in defense yes. side because you're the mm -hmm. best getter keeps everybody there. People are like, man, I've been sitting out here all day. Right. And remember, most witnesses don't get a chance to go inside the trial. They're literally sitting outside in a hallway by themselves, not talking to anybody. Right. And you have them sit there all day and eventually you're like, where's the witness? Right. Oh, goodness. Judge, can we have a moment? Now, some judges are not that kind. They're not. <laughs> and, yeah. and this is true, they're, right? They're some judges, where's your next witness? <laughs> and if you don't have your next witness, oh, you're very challenging your case. Right, so right. Yeah, this could be witness number one. Yeah. Witness number one could be saying mm -hmm. to the state, I'm not doing it. Right. And I think they might have just changed it up today, right, as far as um, who's the going to The order of witnesses. Order. So they right. might have had uh, John Doe, Jane Doe, sorry, number one, and oh, goodness, where's Jane Doe, too? She's not here? Somebody please go get her. Sure. And I like what you said about potentially having a lower offer if she is hesitant. So the state might come to it at the last moment and say, instead of giving you 25 to life, what about 20? Mm -hmm. yes. And then uh, the defense is like, well, I need to talk to my client. At least give us an hour or two to talk about this. And the defense attorney might be saying, hey, that might be a better deal. Yeah. Let's you have small children. It. You have mm -hmm. a spouse. Um, you want to see them again. You want to see your grandkids grow up. Mm -hmm. Look, take the 20. You've already been convicted. That's coming in. Mm -hmm. The judge has already made a ruling on that. You're not going to get to talk about prior intimacy with her boyfriend. Mm -hmm. That's not coming in. Mm -hmm. So although you may have appellate issues that we could survive on appeal, sir, that's going to take quite some time. Your life is going to pass and you're going to be serving prison time while you're waiting for us to win on appeal. Why wouldn't you just make the deal? Mm -hmm. Take the 20. You're a young man. You'll be out while you're still healthy and mm -hmm. you could still enjoy the rest of you know your years if your life expectancy is you know 75 years right. I think also the divorce proceeding mm -hmm. might even be a more a legal strategy mm -hmm. than it is an emotional issue I've seen right. cases before where if he's convicted mm -hmm. remember his assets come up for grab mm -hmm. and if I divorce him I get to keep majority of the assets in the divorce proceeding mm -hmm. and then when the civil suits start rolling in he they has will. absolutely nothing uh, I'm glad you brought that up Marsha glad you brought that up great point brilliant great point education. and something <laughs> else I, I want to make to this point when, when, remember when, way back when, when this case first came about and Kellen Winslow II said, this is a money grab, but he talked to reporters very calmly, he was calm, cool, collected, this is a money grab, it's all it is, said something to the effect of, unfortunately, in this day and age, that's what we see. Those alleged victims never filed any civil suits. Mm -hmm. So to call it a money grab may have been a little premature at that point because nothing had been filed. We kind of kept waiting and waiting for the other shoe to drop. Well, you don't want to drop that shoe if you're a civil litigator until the conviction <laughs> right. is solidified. Mm -hmm. So I can tell you, when I saw that the divorce proceeding was filed after mm -hmm. the conviction, hmm, makes me say, hmm, because hmm. you knew of the allegations against your spouse right. way before. Right. You were involved in the trial portion. You mm -hmm. understand who the Looking victims are. Nothing new occurred other than the fact that your spouse is now convicted. So protect the home protect the kids, protect the retirement, mm -hmm. file the divorce, let him not con you know, contest mm -hmm. the divorce, mm -hmm. give her everything in the divorce proceeding, mm -hmm. let her have it, now it belongs to her. Mm -hmm. All 100% legal interest to the spouse, and then you can bring all the civil suits you want because 100 million of nothing, 100% of nothing is nothing. Nothing, yeah, great points. Uh, Marsha and Keith, thank you both so much. Uh, we're gonna squeeze in a quick break right now as we are still waiting to try to figure out why this delay, opening statements were supposed to start minutes ago. We're going to give you a live update from our crew outside the courthouse in just minutes after this break. Don't go.
two fantastic attorneys, Keith Lamar and Marsha Migno. Thank you both so much for staying with us. Let's talk about the clip we just saw where the verdicts were read mm -hmm. and, and Kellen Winslow II looked stunned. Didn't he look stunned? Right. When, I mean, okay, did not expect that reaction, right? He mm -hmm. truly looked like his jaw dropped. Uh, right. Yeah. Um, what do you think in terms of you know, a, a differing approach, what, what might the defense have to do different this time around? Not necessarily what they want to do different, but anything you really see as maybe a glaring something they've got to change up for this jury. Well, the, one, the one thing that we talked about earlier that they have to do, this time he can't just sit there in his suit and just stand and watch his attorneys talk. He's going to have to get engaged. He's going to have to be a part of the trial. He's got to get up. He's got to say it. They have got to get make him more personal to the jury. Mm -hmm. Explain who he is. Talk a little bit about who he is. Talk about his career. You know, talk about everything that he's done leading up to this particular point and why he is who he is and why he did not. The key word did not uh, rape these women. Right. Right. Marsha, what do you yeah, think? Th that's my point. My point would I would hone in on 2009, and I would come back with in 2009 he signed a contract for 36. Point one million dollars. Mm -hmm. There is 36.1 million reasons why my client did not do what he is alleged to have done in this case. Make him testify, prepare him properly for cross-examination, put him up there, let him explain what took place, explain the relationship, because if you explain the relationship between yourselves and the, the, himself and these women, you can explain why mm -hmm. these women would make these allegations because they are some severe allegations. Mm -hmm. You're absolutely, absolutely right. Both of you make excellent points. And something uh, you said, Keith, that made me think of this. Tell them more about him, the story of his life. And thinking about the jury there, when you really think about it, even though he grew up in that area, he went all over the country playing football, playing for four different teams, one of which was not the San Diego Chargers, like his dad. So while his dad may be someone very well known and beloved in that area, people may not know a lot about Kellen Winslow II. Right. So maybe, do you think that might have been what was lacking a lot more about his life, a lot more about his story? And, and I know there may be some relevancy objections you know, lodged by the prosecution if you go too far afield, but right. In the places like the open you, and the you want to know who you are. You know, I'm sure the state's going to paint a picture of him as, like you said, a predator. They're going to paint a very negative light. So you want to make sure that, because the first time around, I don't think they did a good enough job of saying, you know, who are you the person? You know, we're not just trying this random defendant. You know, mm -hmm. you want to be known as the defendant. You want to be known as Kellen. Right. You know, not Mr. Winslow, Kellen, or whatever nickname he might have right. had growing up. You know, make it personal. Make it something that, well, dang, would he have done this? You know, feel like you actually grew up with him. By the time the, the trial is over with, you should have got a full eclipse of this whole man's life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Agreed. And, and you don't want him to be eclipsed by his father's career. Right. Um, that's one of the problems you have is that people might love your dad, but they don't love you mm -hmm. or they don't know you. Mm -hmm. So you cannot afford for just having his father sitting in the gallery and believe that that's enough that dad's showing up every day and dad's supportive. Because there are some people who are going to say a parent is always going to support their child even when their child is wrong. Mm -hmm. Sure, mm -hmm. so sure. Tell us who he is right. and why he does not have the character to do the things that they're alleging that he's done. Exactly. And I want to mention something else for our viewers who may now just now be, be tuning in. We're delayed until 4.30 p.m. Eastern time for the start of opening statements. And when I was talking with our Court TV legal correspondent moments ago, she told us that Kellen Winslow Sr. had a moment in the courtroom where um, the judge wasn't on the bench. Everyone was kind of just milling about and seated in the gallery. And the deputy district attorney, Dan Owens, who's the prosecutor trying this case all by himself, looked over at Kellen Winslow Sr. and... Uh, his wife and the family members supporting Kellen Winslow and uh, Kellen Winslow Sr. looked back at him and said, do not look over here. Mm. I mean, just with such disdain and, and really like a, a papa bear kind of moment, um, that love that dad has so strong for his son, like being protective, even as he's sitting rows behind his son who is incarcerated, not going home to his house tonight. Um, your thoughts on, on what we just learned uh, about that? I, I think that's a normal reaction for mm -hmm. a parent. And I think based on the conversations you've had with your child as you've been rearing him, dad has to be sitting there thinking about all the times that he went to ball games and all the times, you know, being at his son's wedding, being at his grandkids' birth, mm -hmm. and to think about the thought of his son being separated. He sees the prosecutor right now as the enemy. Mm -hmm. So it's it's a, I think it was a natural reaction. I'm sure counsels are like, hey, 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 we don't want 
any problems right. with security or the sheriffs. You want to sit here. You want the jurors to be able to see you. If you behave in such a manner, the court will put you out. Mm -hmm. So please don't let it happen again. I know you might have had a natural reaction to you know seeing him look over there and you think he's your enemy, but be careful that we don't have the luxury of you sitting here and watching this entire trial because of your misconduct. Good point. And, and, that's, and that's very normal. You know, you're talking about sending away a man for life. Okay, this man, this father has been through a lot in his life. He's seen the ups, and he's, it's probably the lowest he's ever been in his entire life. He's talking about his son. And yes, yeah, I agree with you. Parents, sometimes, even when you're wrong, they're like, oh my goodness. But at the end of the day, you know, it's a lot of pressure on him. I'm sure he wakes up every day and he's like, man, I got to go out here in this trial. And to see the prosecutor, I'm not sure how he looked at him, but I know that that can happen in a courtroom in any setting, even for cases that are not as, as high. So at the end of the day, you got to be very smart as a prosecutor to make sure that you don't push those buttons as well. Absolutely. You both make excellent points, and, and it's, it, it helps us be mindful, too, of how trials and criminal charges affect not just the defendant involved, not just the alleged victims involved, but family members, children, parents as well. Um, hearts go out to all of them. Keith Lamar, Marsha McNeil, you two are wonderful. Thank oh, you thank so you. much for being with us, lending your expertise to Court TV Live. Always great to have you here. What we're going to do is take a short break. When we come back, my colleague Seema Iyer will be joining me here in the studio. We're going to talk about what is coming up next here on Court TV Live. Don't go away.